Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm very excited to be here. It's very exciting to see these topics, the topics that, um, that with the topic that we'll be discussing today, in a stage as such an important event as the World Economic Forum. Um, it's very um, exciting to see that. Um, I will dare to say that most of us in this room uh, agree that um, the way we're doing business, the way we're living our lives, the way we are consuming is just uh, not sustainable. We are um, living uh, off our savings account in this planet already. So um, we must change the way we do business. Um, there's not such a thing as a infinite growth. So, um, and I take as a, as a, as a premise that it, it is not development if it is not sustainable. So, um, and we are actually not only uh, uh, living off our savings account, as, as, as I will say, but we're also crippling the ability of uh, the systems of this planet to um, restore and produce the, the natural resources uh, that we need to live in this planet. So uh, I'm glad to be here with a group of uh, experts coming uh, from, um, from different areas. And uh, we hope today we're going to have a very uh, open discussion, open conversation, and we hope to uh, answer just one basic question. Hopefully by the end of this session we will have a, uh, an answer. And it's basically to uh, have a common vision on the region of how to um, manage this asset than the Amazon is. And that is a part of uh, seven different countries. Uh, there is no, uh, there's no um, uh, unity in how to deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, harnessing uh, sustainable the, the resources that the, the Amazon provides, the ecosystem services. There is no single policy. Um, so hopefully we, we address that today. Uh, how can we develop uh, a common vision to uh, deal with a sustainable harnessing of, um, of the Amazon and the protection of the Amazon that is so important for our long-term um, um, economic uh, sustainable in, in, in this planet and in this region as well. So um, I would like to briefly start by introducing our uh, panelists. Uh, let me start with Yvonne. She's the Secretary of State for the Yasuni ITT Initiative of Ecuador. Uh, Juan Carlos Castilla. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Planetary Skin Institute of the USA. Roberto Salas is the Chief Executive Officer of Masisa, Chile. And Virgilio Mauricio Viana, the General Director of Fundación Amazonas Sustentable from Brazil. So uh, I would like to start this conversation by um, uh, asking uh, Juan Carlos to uh, bring us up to speed in terms of uh, the health of the Amazon. Where are we right now? Right. So uh, from a um, scientific and technological perspective, the current state of the Amazon is that there are multiple assets that form part of the natural infrastructure, which is represented by the Amazon Basin. For example, uh, the fact that it uh, hosts 15% of total world biodiversity, for example, that 20% of all fresh water entering into the global oceans comes from the Amazon and its tributaries. For example, that the Amazon Basin holds 15 years worth of greenhouse emissions in terms of carbon stored in the biomass. And the list could go on and on and on. And yet, we have that asset and that natural infrastructure. And yet, there are quite significant risks that we're facing with the Amazon Basin as, a, as an ecosystem. Uh, and a point of note, perhaps, to, to, uh, to focus our minds is the fact, the statistical and scientific fact, that over the last seven years, there have been four very significant extreme events affecting the Amazon Basin. Uh, there have been uh, two one in 100 year flood events and two at least one in 100 uh, drought events. Now, by simple ecosystem science, uh, when a system oscillates between two extremes, 
it is a sign, an early warning sign, that the whole ecosystem may be in, the, in a rapid transition process from one equilibrium stage, which is the Amazon as we know today, into a savanna. And that would have two drastic consequences mm -hmm. to even consider, not only on the, on the fact that 15 years worth of global <laughs> greenhouse emissions would be emitted, in a relatively short period of time, but also affecting, of course, um, the rainfall patterns, not only of Brazil and Argentina, but globally. Um, and the tipping points are, are uh, science, of course, uh, doesn't ever want to be precise because there's always uncertainty in the science, but what is becoming clearer and clearer over time is that there are two important tipping points to get to such uh, uh, catastrophic consequences. And one tipping point is related to the average global temperature reaching about 3.5 degrees centigrade. And uh, let us note that global temperature has increased since pre-industrial times already 0.8 of a degree centigrade. And another tipping point is related to the fact of total deforested area in the Amazon basin. And the tipping point there is about 40% of uh, the total area. And let me note again that we have already consumed half of that tipping point because 20% of the whole Amazon basin has been deforested. Now, the difference between the two tipping points is important for us in terms of policy making, in terms of investment, in terms of what science and technology can do to understand the risk, but also to solve for the, for the very complex problem that we have at hand that you articulated in the beginning. The first tipping point, the global temperature increase, is a global issue. The Amazon countries ha have a role to play, but it is a minor role to play versus the bigger picture of global greenhouse emissions. However, on the second tipping point, it is very much a regional issue. It is very much a country by country issue and a regional issue to go beyond top down policies of, for example, in Brazil, being successful, relatively successful in reducing the deforestation rate by 80% in the last few years. Um, so there, there are implications associated to that, of course, in, uh, on the practical side, what to do about that. So on, the, on, on, on two fronts, we believe that there are significant opportunities to do something about that. One first opportunity is related to getting a hold and being very uh, precise, as precise as we can get, in terms of developing an early warning system for the Amazon as a whole in order to avoid and to inform decision makers at the governmental level, in the private sector, in the communities involved, whether we are in effect in a runaway situation and how can we avoid that situation. So one is an area related to risk management and pan-Amazonia early warning system for that. But the other, the other angle is, is, is very much an opportunity because, of course, every risk has also the other side, as our Chinese friends always remind us, every risk has a, a great and important opportunity. And the opportunity that we see, and it's actually being uh, uh, championed by uh, some Brazilian leaders uh, in the science and te technology field, uh, is related to establishing a completely new model uh, for the Amazon which is a high-tech innovation model that looks at the biodiversity in the Amazon and that uses the best of high technology, advanced biotechnology, nanotechnology, biomimicry, uh, molecular genomics, and a number of very advanced science and technology development that can develop a high-tech model that, of course, requires a Silicon Valley equivalent for the Amazon and that has a number of preconditions as an alternative way, or rather a complementary way, to more sustainable activity in the uh, agricultural frontier of the Amazon, which of course goes through, or needs to go through, a, a very significant increase in, in productivity increases, not to encroach further into the Amazon. Thank you. At this point, just to conclude, uh, are we getting to these tipping points faster, or is it slowing down? No, I think we, we, we would argue that the uh, four extreme uh, weather events, large weather events in the Amazon in the last seven years, 
is a wake-up call, a huge wake-up call, that we have to get our act together. We can't just pretend it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. we, we can't be precise about that, but I would argue that the evidence, statistical evidence, uh, risk management statistical evidence is that we are approaching a transition into something that we can't control, really. Okay, thank you for giving us a, a clear picture of what's going on and the, and the options and possibilities that actually remain. Uh, I would like now to hear Yvonne, because uh, you have a pretty interesting project going on. Tell us a little bit about that living oil in the ground uh, uh, to protect the Amazon. How, how does a country actually get to achieve something like that? That's a very good question, because how it's not easy. It's not easy for a country like Ecuador that still depends on oil. Our first source of income is still oil. And with all this difficult decision, the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, in the year 2007, he took a very courageous decision. Uh, he presented this initiative, the Asuni Initiative, as an idea at that moment, as an idea during the General Assembly of um, the United Nations as an idea to move our dependency of oil into alternative energy in the next 13, 20 years. And he said, we have a place in the Amazon called the Yasuni, which is around 1 million hectares of the Amazon of Ecuador, that place specifically, where climate change has never affected that specific place because of the geographical position of that place, which is just in the intersection of the equatorial line and the Andes Mountains. And just because of giving, being there in that position, a little higher than the rest mm. of the Amazon, climate change never affected it, not even during the last ice age, 12,000 years ago, when the Amazon became a savanna, except this place, the Yasuni. That's why the word Yasuni in the Warani language means sacred land. It was protected, according to them, because of that position. So all the animals from the Amazon came to the Yasuni. That's why we have the highest biodiversity of flora and fauna, but also we have indigenous communities that live there in voluntary isolation, the Tagaeris and Taromenani, but we have another richness, as you mentioned, Nicolás, that it's oil underground. 20% of the oil of Ecuador is under the Yasuni ITT. The ITT is the Spingo Tambococha Tibutini fields that are under the ground of the Yasuni initiative. So President Correa said, Ecuador is ready to do this because we believe in preservation. It's not about just talk, you know. We always talk about the need of preserving but one thing is to need the need, the other thing is the will to do it. So he said we would like to do that because Ecuador believes in living in harmony with nature and because the only constitution of, or one of the only constitutions in the world that gives rights to nature is the Ecuadorian constitution. That they say in the first, uh, uh, you know, the constitution of Ecuador says that because the mother earth cannot talk, we have to give it rights as we give the human, human rights, the, the earth has to have the rights also. So this was the way he presented and he said, what we need is the co-responsibility of the developed world to give us a um, contribution, half of what we will get if we exploit the oil of the Yasuni. The studies that were done, according to the studies in 2007, we had around um, a billion barrels, maybe we have much more if we do it now, but at the time the studies gave around 1 billion, 846 million barrels of oil the price was 40, 45 uh, dollars a barrel. After the investments that we needed, they said that the results will be around 7.2 billion that we will get at that time. And what we asked is 3.6 billion in the next 13 years at that time. That was 2007. Well, it was an idea. Now it's a reality. We created a trust fund with the United Nations Development Program and it was a little difficult to do the trust fund because it's a different trust fund. It took three years to, be, to, to make. And now we have a trust fund. We have a board of directors that it's administered. I mean, the fund is administered by UNDP. It has members of the board, the countries that have supported the initiative. In this case, now it's Italy and Spain. Uh, we have indigenous communities that are members of the board. We have a Warani woman and a Quechua man that's a member of the board. And of course, the government of Ecuador the Ministry of the Secretary of, of, uh, of, of the Strategic um, Projects and also the one that Semplades, which is the project that we have because the capital that comes to the fund goes to alternative energy and the interest, they go for conservation, social development of the people that live there and science 
and investigation technologies to, 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 to investigate because we haven't done anything of investigation. So these are the only points where the money can go. So as I said, now it's a reality. I'm heading the negotiations group since uh, 2011. I mean, I started 2010 at the end because the trust fund was created at the end of 2010. From 2011, we did an internal campaign to create awareness with the people of Ecuador first, to have the people of Ecuador be proud of having a place that is unique and why we have to save it. It was a very successful campaign internally. And last year, we did the campaign internationally. We started the international campaign. It was called I Am Yasuni. It's taking the Yasuni to the world. We couldn't do it because it's not easy to bring the people to the Yasuni. It's difficult. But we took, we call it a sensorial tunnel, that it's like a part of Yasuni to different places. Like when we went to Rio Plus 20, we had the tunnel. We won among the first prize for that, for that tunnel, which is like entering into the Yasuni, a small piece of the sounds of the jungle, the, 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 the smell and the Warani uh, message, why we want to preserve that place. So that was the last year's campaign. And in fact, we have now partnered with uh, around 19 countries that have supported the initiative. We opened it to the civil society and the private sector and NGOs. Uh, we have um, many companies that are partnering with us. We have civil, uh, you know, social, uh, civil society that have, we can give any amount, and we have, we have arrived to around 367 million now that we have um, as, as contribution, co-responsibility. But it's still the awareness is not yet there, and that's why when sometimes they ask me why is it that the president is saying that we haven't seen the reaction of what we, because those that are giving are mostly developing countries, some of them are developed countries, and and the majority of, well, companies, of course, because those are companies that they care for sustainable development, but the awareness of really something new. It's a new idea of prevention. It's Let about me. prevention, not about remediation. It's not about cutting the trees and doing reforestation like was done in Brazil, uh, so reforestation. It's about not cutting the trees and being you know, as, um, supported by not doing that. Let me, let me ask you a question regarding that. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a very innovative model. Very innovative. Do you, do, you, do you see a model like that working on a regional basis, like in other countries? What have been the reactions of, uh, of the other countries? That's what we wanted. In fact, we were talking about uniting the Amazon countries together to work on something of protecting the whole Amazon, not just a piece of the Amazon. When we did the trust fund, you're talking about the region. When we did the trust fund, the first country that supported the initiative, even if it was a symbolic support, it was Chile. The second one was Colombia and Peru. With Peru, we are getting a support that it's uh, symbolic, I said, in, in amounts. But it reflects that there is care. We would like very much to have more of this. And when we were in the last meeting in Davos, uh, we had meetings with Juan Carlos. Juan Carlos started in Dubai, in the, uh, in the World Economic Forum of Dubai. The idea was exactly that, because Carlos was there and with it, to create this kind of how to save the Amazon, like what we're doing now. How can we work together? If we are together, it will be by far more uh, impressive in, in, sh in showing the world that the Amazon is being uh, saved by the countries that belong to the Amazon. Because if you talk to scientists, they tell you that in order to regulate climate change, we have to save the Amazon. To regulate climate change, we have to save the Amazon. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. Um, Let's go uh, to, uh, to the business perspective. We'd like to hear uh, about uh, the business perspective. Yesterday, I was in this, in this panel um, talking precisely about uh, the trade-offs between sustainability, uh, sustainable development, and, 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 and the growth, economic growth of countries. And uh, we were talking about the Amazon as well. And uh, actually, the president of the Inter-American Development Bank mentioned that uh, of this uh, road that is being built from uh, mm -hmm. connecting the, the east coast to the west coast of, of the continent. So trade can be uh, uh, done from Brazil to the western countries. So for me, I mean, and, and of course they're saying that that will help develop the region also in terms of um, sustainable development. But, I, I, but in reality, I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't pretend to be, but for me, that's just regular development. I mean, we're just putting a road, there's no way if, to build an environmental friendly road through a virgin, a virgin pristine forest. So for me, that's just normal development. But still, I mean, it's needed because it's fair and the trade of the country and the economic development needs to be uh, uh, growth. 
So how do you manage that? How, how, how a, a, a regional approach to the protection of the Amazon and the sustainable development of the Amazon will help or affect your business? Cecilia, let, let me talk about a, a very uh, expanding perspective. Usually in the business sector, there is a line for incentives. But I think that in the last uh, at least 10 or 15 years, from the United two, perhaps 20 years, with a new, a new way of thinking about sustainability, the balance in sustainability and business, profit and planet and people, uh, it's created a, a more important in companies and people managers, CEOs, and, um, and businessmen, entrepreneurs that are more aligned with this kind of philosophy. But uh, for, for a uh, very important reason, we have some way of thinking that the, we would like to understand the roots of the, of the problems. In the case of deforestation in, in, in Amazon, or even in other areas, for example, in the Chaco area region in, in Paraguay, Argentina, and Bolivia, uh, we, we can find the same reasons. For example, and, and one of the reasons is the market itself. For example, let me tell you some, some numbers. The total amount of forestry worldwide is more or less uh, 4 billion hectares, 4,000 millions of hectares. And the 7% of the forestry, of that forestry, is planted forestry. And the 7% contribute with the 50% of the production of formal goods for the market to supply the, 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 the demand. So when you see this, you say, probably we can have some solution using this kind of uh, statistics. We say, we say, for example, that yes, that the answer is yes, because if we promote a more responsible way to, to, to manage the forestry business, to increase, uh, to double probably the, the level of the, of the production of the responsible and sustainable forestry, we are going to mitigate one of the principal reasons for what the, the, the deforestation occurs in the Amazon and in other parts. Yeah. For, for clarification, and, and just because I think it's important what you're saying, uh, because it relates a lot to what you do, can you, can you clarify what, what is it, what you do, what is uh, Masima, so the it's audience knows? Mainly, for example, we are working in two main uh, new standards of the sustainable forestry. The number one with the WWF, we are part of the of a, uh, multi-sectorial uh, uh, group to develop the new standard of the forestry for the next, uh, for the next years. Uh, what is that? It's to balance in a better way the environmental and social way to plan and to uh, execute the, the, the forestry project in the future. And to contribute not just for the, for the supply of the, of the demand, but in the way that we do that and the way that we create uh, the value. So we, with this kind of new standards, we, we try to balance the contribution to the formal supply for one, for, for one side, and on the other side, to improve quality of life with the local communities, mm -hmm. mainly indigenous communities that are living the, in, the, in, this, in these areas, and on the other part, obviously, to contributing to the reduction of uh, emissions and all the effects of the deforestation. So, uh, so yeah, uh, can you just give us a, a brief of what your business is? We, we are, Masisa is a company that is in the forestry business. We have more or less two, 242,000 of hectares in, in many countries, in Chile mainly, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Venezuela. And we, with this forestry, we sell wood, and at the same time, we're recycling the waste of, the, of this proce wood processed to manufacture panels for furniture, like this. I hope that this furniture will be made with a, <laughs> with a Masisa panel, but it's not, it's not a problem. <laughs> but, but in the same time, for example, we, we, we see with very, very good eyes what is happening, for example, in the Amazon. In the Amazon, for example, we, say, we, we, we learn from the Avina Foundation and some information that we have, because we are very close to, to the Avina Foundation, that in the last five years, what you mentioned, with the monitoring 
uh, with incentives to, to, to the preservation and the new efforts in a multilateral collaborated uh, project, they are saving of deforestation an amount of land equivalent to Costa Rica plus El Salvador. That's very good news. How we can do to, dupli to replicate that in other parts, for example, in Chaco or, or in other areas that, that this is a, is a problem today. In fact, the Avina Foundation is here, was the first one to give us also from foundations, private sector, to give us uh, yeah. money for the Yasuni project. I learned that. I'm proud of that, uh, Sean. <laughs> thank you. If you can join us in this panel. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Roberto. Virgilio, uh, uh, why don't you tell us briefly what you do? I am the Director General of Amazon Sustainable Foundation, which is a non-profit organization, a Brazilian one, uh, based in uh, Manaus, in the Amazon. And we work with developing solutions for communities in the Amazon. We work currently with 541 communities uh, in the rainforest. And we promote all kinds of uh, issues running from education to health to income generation, everything around uh, one simple strategy. We need to make forests worth more standing than cut oh. to those people who live there. Because people cut the forest not because they're stupid or ignorant. They cut the forest because they see that as an opportunity to improve their livelihood. So yes, yes. what we're working is to make them see the forest as more valuable standing. And in order to do that, we invest in forest management, fisheries management, and also something which I believe is one of the solutions for the Amazon, which is payment for environmental services. The forest is a exactly. major provider service. of services. And we just don't account for those services. We don't value those services. Mm -hmm. And we take a sort of a free lunch on the benefits that the forest is providing to all of us. And that is, I think, the, one of the key elements that we need to change for the future of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how can we, I mean, how can you work in, in making these local communities that you work with, I mean, fantastic work, to live in a more sustainable way, knowing that they need their, this income they're taking from, from the forest in order to improve their lives, as you were saying. How, how can you work on, on, on educating them to, to be more, living more sustainable lives? The first step is to value these services. And uh, just if I can show one image uh, there of the services provided by, by the rainforest, we have to value and, and measure this. And, and for this, we have very good science at, at the moment on how to, to measure the, the flow of, of, uh, of humidity. So the solution? Uh, first of all, it starts with the measurement of the so services provided by the forest. So it's, it comes from outside, not necessarily No, it comes from, from inside. Within. It's the, most, there are a number of services, but I'll just highlight the water service. The forests produce water mm -hmm. through the process of uh, photosynthesis. And that is as a water pump. So the humidity that generate uh, rainfalls in, uh, in Ecuador comes from Eastern Amazonia. Mm -hmm. So we're all connected. Uh, and this environmental service has a value. It, it not only sends humidity to Ecuador, but also it sends humidity to uh, southern South America, to Argentina, and to southern Brazil, which feeds agriculture. Uh, and it also feeds hydropower generation. So we should insert in the uh, electricity bill a part of the payment for the Amazon that generates rain uh, for the rest of the continent. And then the second uh, aspect, and uh, I don't see the, the, the image, maybe the, the help desk could put the image in there. Is it is possible to put an image there on, was, on the I screen? think it was there. Yeah, there was came. an image. There was an there. image. Oh, there thank you. I think maybe there we go. Um, because I, this is, is a, a very intuitive way of, this, of seeing what I've just described. It's the flow of humidity in the globe. Uh, and there you see hour by hour, day by day, month by month. And uh, if we have a look at the Amazon, we're here. We're here in Peru. And the humidity that is pumped across the globe has a major influence of the rainforests. So 
the generation of electricity here in southern Brazil, the agricultural production and supply to cities depends on the Amazon. So we need to value that. So what do we do? First is to value this, especially in terms of carbon uh, and, and water, and then create a revenue stream that we invest in communities through two, thing, two things. First is education, and second is through income. So it's the pocket and the brain and consciousness. That's a dual approach. Mm -hmm. And for that we do with a number of private sector partners. Most of our uh, funding is from the private sector. Uh, the Amazonas Foundation has just grown to become the, the largest Brazilian foundation as of last year. We have uh, one partner here, uh, Merit uh, International Hotels, who uh, was one of the pioneer investors in developing a private partnership in uh, in protecting the rainforest. So I, I'm a strong believer in valuing what we're seeing here, you now this flow of water in this, in this little uh, film here, what is white is water vapor, and what is yellowish are storms. So this is something that we have to uh, give value and also see that we're all interconnected. Ecuador depends on Brazil. And then we depend on Ecuador because the rivers that feed the Amazon come from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Peru. Actually, the Amazon River starts in Peru, so we send humidity through the clouds and receive it back through the rivers. So we need to work more together. And I strongly uh, agree with the vision right. of Yvonne in the sense that we, we should have more cooperation, more south-south cooperation within the region so that we share lessons learned. It's doable. It's possible to reduce deforestation. Brazil has reduced deforestation by 80%, uh, more than 80%, uh, and very so, well measured. So will it be fair to say that while we outside don't find, look for a way to value these environmental services that it's obvious the Amazon provides in terms of climate regulation, rain, water cycles, and all of that, it's going to be more difficult to help these local communities to, to live a sustainable life within the Amazon. Well, we have to come up with financing. Uh, and the problem is that these communities usually are small. They don't have lots of votes. Uh, and it's much more expensive to provide education and health services and income opportunities to them. So we need to find new creative ways to finance this. Uh, and one of the ways, in my opinion, is through carbon, through water services, and biodiversity. Uh, through projects like... Like yes, yeah, right. uh, there are different approaches. Okay. Not well, to, to how, how, how will, uh, coming back to, to the question that we need to, we hope to answer here today, how will, uh, will a common framework on the region will help that goal of bringing these, these communities together? I think, first of all, if we should go united in, in the international negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, we are suffering uh, the failure of Copenhagen, you know, the, the climate change negotiations, which were basically uh, a frustration. Uh, and we need to go together to uh, these fora and, and make the case that we should have instruments to value these services. We should come together in the international trade negotiations because a cell phone that comes from Manaus, Manaus is the largest producer of cell phones in, in, in Brazil and wow. one of the largest in Latin America. It's the largest producer of motorcycles in the whole Americas. A motorcycle that is produced in Manaus should be taxed differently than a motorcycle coming from China uh, because the ecological footprint is the opposite. So we should be more aggressive, more creative in finding ways to come up with the appropriate financing for sustainable development in the Amazon. We should not just depend on the treasury of the national governments or the state governments because it's a different logic. And I think we should see that in the national interest Oftentimes, we as South Americans, we tend to, to look at conserving the Amazon as an outside agenda imposed on us. But rather, we should see protecting the rainforest as in the interest of Brazil, of Ecuador, and Colombia, and, and, and so on. And that is subtle, but it's a huge difference. Uh, we sh we're not talking to the Europeans or to North Americans only, of course, it has a value to the rest of the planet. But more importantly, it has a value to us as Latin Americans. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Nicolas, maybe, maybe I can complement that, that, that great um, 
that great uh, um, framework uh, of valuing ecosystem services. Yesterday we had a fascinating discussion orchestrated by our friends here at the forum and by Leo sitting here uh, on the concept of natural infrastructure, uh, of the Amazon being a representative of a, a key representative of that concept of natural infrastructure. And, and the, the linkage is this. When we talk about infrastructure, we typically think about physical infrastructure, the roads, the telecommunications, the energy infrastructure, the water infrastructure. By the way, the numbers in the next 18 years, by however you cut the numbers, the infrastructure capex required in the next 18 years is around about 60 trillion US dollars. A part of it, a large part of it, has to do with closing the gaps, particularly in emerging markets. But a significant portion has to do with maintenance of that physical infrastructure. And so the linkage is through the great story that uh, our friend was, was uh, commenting on the water cycle. If we can link those investment and creative financing mechanisms to deploy that physical infrastructure, if we can deploy and divert a portion of those um, um, large financial flows into protecting and maintaining natural infrastructure, we can reduce the physical capex needs. Let me give you a very specific example, which I've been thinking ever since our conversation yesterday. Given that in Brazil, for example, a large portion of the, um, of the uh, energy, en energy matrix and of the certain countries of the region of the energy matrix is hydro, if for any reason the ecosystem service provided in the water cycle and in the transport of, regional transport of water ceases to be as predictable as it is today, which act, by the way, it's happening already, then the hydro needs and the capex associated with alternative forms of more polluting energy will increase. And therefore, it is in our enlightened self-interest as an investor, as a policymaker, as a private investor in energy infrastructure to reduce my capex needs if I invest strategically out of my own self-benefit in maintaining natural infrastructure. There you have a large pool of funds which are associated to the physical infrastructure that is highly dependent on the stability and the maintenance of natural infrastructure with the Amazon being the iconic and natural infrastructure class. So with, I mean, all the perspectives have been put on the table. Um, communities, business, a project that is working and is different, and the science. How can we mix everything, put everything together to actually come out, come up with a with a with a framework, a regional framework that actually works? I was I was talking to a friend before this meeting, and she reminded me of this uh, uh, Winston Churchill phrase uh, after the war that uh, he said that uh, who, if I want to talk to Europe. Who should I call? So it's, we can apply that to the Amazon right now. There's no Amazon uh, uh, regional organization. Who, who, who should? Uh, there is the Otka. A regional one that is actually taking a, 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 a regional framework. Is, is there, there, if yeah. there is one? So the there's release and light us. No, there is. The is, is it working? Should we? It, it is. It is working, but it needs more. I think there is a lack of leadership there to unite them. I don't want to criticize anyone. I think they have very good people, but it's still always the bureaucratic part takes over. And instead of being an institution that unites us for the purposes of creating, like you mentioned, environmental service, this is what we have to focus on. This is something that, because everything is based on how much we get out of it. I mean, when you mention about the wood, that it's being cut because the needs of the people are there, because they have to cut economic you know, uh, income, ecotourism is one, of course, but it destroys if you don't do it the right way, so they have to do it somewhere. But if you put the environmental service and you give, uh, uh, the biodiversity has, 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 has something, I mean, you have to put value to it. What is the value? I'm sure that if the Amazon was in another place of the world, long time ago they would have made us pay for it, for the service that we're giving because of the Amazon. So something of that should be done. 
And I think this organization is working on other issues than the issue of creating the value of what the Amazon really is and the power of it. And the other thing is that, like all kinds of meetings that you get together, always you talk and talk, and then when you go to your countries, you forget everything of what really the issue is. And the issue is that you cannot forget of the strength that we have together. And it's a strength. Yeah. So when you go to the, to the meetings, everything looks wonderful. And then when you go out of it, it just goes to every priority that every country has instead of creating the priority together. I would say, Nicholas, that uh, unfortunately, this scenario is not very positive. Uh, we don't have an institutional framework in place, although we do have formally OTCA, which stands for the Organization of the Treaty of Cooperation of the Amazon Countries. Right. It's, uh, it has, it's a formal institution run by diplomats. Uh, it's based in Brasilia. So the uh, question is, does it work? Should we, well, should we, should it, we follow it, that path? Well, I think... Should something different I, be created? I think uh, it has the same problems as the UN has. It's the right institution doing the right thing, but at a very slow speed. And the problem is that we have Towards the right direction? It's in the right direction. It's doing the right things, but at a very slow speed. It's just like the UN. It's doing the right things. The discourse is right. But it just doesn't have the, uh, the urgency that the planet needs. The so the question to all of us that I think we should ask is what business, what civil society, a government should do uh, to speed up the process of change. We need urgent changes in our lifestyles and in the way we deal with the Amazon. And I should add that uh, although it's very important for us to realize the value of the Amazon for our countries, it's also important for the rest of the world to realize the value of the Amazon to the rest of the planet. The United States, for example, uh, runs a sort of a free lunch on, on the services that also the Amazon forests provide to, to the agricultural production in, in, in North America. And that should be valued and compensated for. So we need a movement, and I think that's, that's a question that maybe we want to, to address here. I would say that we will depend more on civil society and, and business to move quickly, because governments are too slow and too compromising in general. And this is me saying having been state secretary for five years. I'm no longer <laughs> in office, so I can say this. Uh, so we need to be more effective and, and, and quicker because the planet is going yeah, but down I think, the, the road. I think there's also the needs to be regulation in a regional yeah. level, and, yeah. and that cannot be provided by the private uh, sector or, uh, or, um, or social sector or citizens. Uh, I, although I, I do agree that it needs to be. Yeah, go. no, I, I am sure that governments have a role. But for example, as we were discussing in, in this morning, uh, it's important for the business and civil society to help governments uh, come up with the right policies because oftentimes we need to have an equal uh, playing field so that all companies in the same sector, say the tourism and travel sector, they have to have a similar uh, tax structure. That needs to be provided by government. But how is that going to be designed? I think that is something that uh, business and, and civil society can help governments in, in designing clever and smart policies. What's, what's your take on this, Rorty? Yeah, I, I think that in all the meetings that I, I, I participate, have participated about uh, sustainability issues or uh, financial issues in the, linked to the sustainability uh, challenges, as the red, for example, or as the bio, fund, uh, bio bonds, uh, there always is the same conclusion. We, we have to collaborate better. But if this is urgently, why it doesn't happen? And that's the, that's the key of the, of the mm -hmm. point. What we have to do different to convert concepts in actions, into actions, and to get results. And perhaps one of the most important things in this is, is not just to know what to do, it's how. And then that we know the how is who. And in the who, I think, is the most important part. Because all the big changes, it's just when you do that when you have a strong leadership. That, that is the key point. It's a, a leader, the, the leaders have to, to the power and the encourage the other people to maintain the institutions stick with their one purpose. 
And then, for example, we can find, for instance, the water uh, issues. We, we, we can have a lot of uh, very good examples of leadership that they uh, bring to the table the problems and they solve it. And a lot of other issues that we, we, st we, we are still working and we're still uh, talking. And what happened? Very, 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 very low level. Let me talk about, for example, all the incentives in the financial area. For example, the, I, I, the first time that I the, heard about the ecosystem payment, the, the service of the uh, ecosystem services yeah. payment, this was uh, perhaps seven years ago. Uh, we are, uh, our company is a carbon positive company because we have forests and we have a lot of uh, uh, way to uh, neutralize the, our emissions in the, in the factories and whatever. But the value of the, of the carbon uh, that we can trade is, is a shame. It's very low. So there's no incentive for anybody. Yeah. How we can convert that in, in, in real opportunity? So leadership is the number one for, in, my, in, my, in my concept to prioritize so, somebody in some part, and not just in, the, in one country, because this, we agree that this is part of the conglomerate of countries. But, yeah, we need a new way to govern the, the planet. In the last conference, the World Business Council, for example, what are the changes that we have to do? We, we, need, we, we talk about the new corporate governance. We need also new ways to govern us, the regional or multi-regional institutions, and nobody's doing that. In the financial area, for example, after the crisis in the 2009, for example, everybody told we have to change the financial uh, industry in all the world, mainly the, not, not just in the United States. And what happened? Nothing. 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 So what, what is the, 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 the driver to change this? And to put in the table and to talk with very open way. From a business yeah. per perspective, that, that's a question for me to you. What, what do you think needs to happen? We think, for example, in the business sector, without any doubt, we need to learn to work together with other institutions, mainly with the NGOs and governments. And why? Because for many years, government and, and, and NGOs, they compete each other. And, and, and NGOs with, uh, with business sector, for many years, they just went to talk to us to ask for money, yeah? 20 years ago or 15 years ago. That is changing, but we need a more interaction to understand better the role and to find out two things. Number one, common interest. But real common interest. That project that goes directly to the, to the way that the company creates value and how social issues we realize that we realize that they are part of the, of the strategy. And number two is to understand each other, not just in the, in the challenges, but in the way that we have to, to do that. And then, for example, we have a wonderful uh, experience, for example, in the country where somebody can tell you this is impossible. For example, in Venezuela. Hmm. In Venezuela, in, 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 the last, uh, in the last five years, we don't talk really with the central government, but we find a lot of opportunities to create social value um, uh, operational efficiency in uh, the factories, they are, part, they are in the rural areas, with the local governments. So the potential partners in the local governments, municipalities, mayors, uh, there are a lot of them that are really part of the, of the new trend. For example, in the Amazonia, we, we knew, for example, that uh, uh, the Avina and other NGOs, they have pro they programs for green municipalities with very high level of success. That they are part of this process to monitoring and to, because they are good politicians that they won't really make a good uh, contribution to the, to the people. And there, companies see an opportunity. Because we need that that part of the community, they are progressing at the same time that the company is progressing. This is part of our, of our, of our feelings, of our philosophy. Yeah? So the, this way of, 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 of to create not just financial capital uh, growth, but social capital growth, and uh, making preservation in the environment, that's part of the new way to do business, yes. And each company has their own philosophy, but this philosophy is gaining a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, priori of priorities. But when we see, for example, very big uh, uh, 
the project, for example, with governments or with, uh, we have to be more passionate to understand and to find out what are the real interests in depth and how we can bring social institutions, communities, uh, and to create value with strong leadership mm -hmm. and measuring the... the, the Thank the you. Let's, let's, um, let's um, uh, get a couple of questions from the, from the audience to see what's uh, their outside perspective. Uh, anybody have a question to the panelists? I have a question for Mr. Viana. Can you state your, your name? My name is Kurt Holly from Air Force Expeditions from Peru. I have a question for Mr. Viana about, I uh, can't remember was it, if it was a year or two years ago, there was a good piece of news about Brazil having a really a reduced deforestation rates in the Amazon. And um, my question is, uh, what were the causes or what were the enabling conditions for this, uh, for this result? in the Brazilian Amazon. What caused the reduction of deforestation rates in Brazil for a year or two? Um, Brazil has, first of all, a very good monitoring system uh, of deforestation. It's, we have monthly data, which is published freely in the internet, all the maps, the raw maps, and uh, we have annual figures, and this is very transparent, and this is something which increases a lot the participation of civil society. So deforestation rates are published basically every month in all Brazilian newspapers. There's something either good or bad. So I think, first of all, it's, it's transparency and accountability uh, on the information. And secondly, were a number of policies that were implemented. And uh, I happened to, to be in government at that time, uh, in, and in 2003, a number of state governments, and that speaks a little bit to what Salas was mentioning, not the federal government, but the state governments in the Amazon, implemented a number of very progressive policies, including the first uh, climate change policy at the state level, which was enacted in 2007. Uh, and there were a number of, of policy instruments that I would uh, say had an impact. Uh, of those, I would uh, uh, highlight the expansion of protected areas. In the state of Amazonas alone, we went from 7 million hectares to 19 million hectares of protected areas. And these areas were established in critical uh, regions in terms of pressure for deforestation. The second were a number of policies intended to increase the value of forest products. For example, we zeroed all the taxes on, on non-timber forest products, so making them more uh, economically attractive. So uh, that economic signal also created uh, something that uh, changed behavior. And I would say that the perspective of valuing forest carbon was also something that uh, became a part of people's mindset, uh, the expectation, which uh, in a way has not been fulfilled because of the international negotiations, but I think combination of these things uh, provided a result. But it's not to say that the game uh, is over and we have solved the problem. We have just reduced the pace of deforestation, but deforestation is still, still happening. Yeah. So in order to have a long-term win, I think we, we have to have an economic victory, and this victory is to make forests worth more standing than cut. Thank you. Any other questions? They're over there, there is a question. Enrique, please. I wanted to ask the panel if they think that... State you, your name, please. My name is Jorge. My name is Enrique Acevedo. Um, and I wanted to ask the panel if, given the presence of organized crime in the Amazon and their involvement with deforestation and mining activities, uh, the presence maybe of uh, UN peacekeepers in the zone might be a possibility, or a multinational force that uh, you know, tries to combat organized crime in that region, which is one of the main reasons of... Uh, how the Amazon is, is doing right now. Organized Who's crime in the Amazon? Take on uh, that. I would I say think you're the this best. is a no-no. <laughs> if the you best. say this to, to any 
uh, Brazilian, no one is sure. considering an, a, a multinational force or anything of this nature. I think we, uh, not only as Brazilians, but as other uh, Amazonian countries, we, we have the means to take care of, of the, of the uh, security issue. That's not to say that the drug problem is not a problem. I mean, security is an issue in the U.S. or in, in Europe or all over the world. Uh, so we all need to cooperate on this. But I think that one issue which is missing in this uh, meeting here in Lima is the issue of legalizing some drugs, uh, because I think that's a hot topic now. Uh, Uruguay has already legalized. Uh, there was this report done by the president of Colombia, president of Brazil, and president of Mexico, who make this case very strongly, and I think this is something that needs to be more debated. Or at to least dec decriminalize the drug, not legalize yeah, it. Decriminalize, it's, yeah. It's easier it's to a, decriminalize it than to legalize it, I think. That's, a, that's a, fir a good first step. Yeah, I it's think. a first step. A and by the way, uh, <laughs> that, that, that issue on, on drugs, etc., is, uh, is, is very much a demand issue, it's not a supply issue. Yeah. In, in fact, if, if you reduce supply, <laughs> you will increase the prices in, in the streets of New York and the traffickers will be better off. <laughs> and and to, connect it, it. Yeah. to connect it to the, to the uh, deforestation <laughs> issue, for example, at least in Colombia, the war on drugs, have a, uh, it's, it's a big, it's a big uh, cost for deforestation because, I mean, they're just cutting off plantations of cocaine and the, the, the growers just move further into the forest, cutting clear cut more, more forest and the government comes back uh, uh, cutting all the, the new plantations and it, the process is an ongoing issue. But, but on the other hand, the, the idea that sparks in my mind for that great uh, question nevertheless on the security is that there is an argument to be made on, on, on we have one minute left on regional security and security which is the, uh, the weather extreme phenomenon that is related to, to climate, ongoing climate change uh, has a security angle, a very important security angle, that is of the self-interest of the nations involved and pan-regionally to do something about for their own enlightened self-interest of reducing the security risks that they have. In this case, not drug trafficking risks, but other type of risks. Thank you. Well. The time is up. I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks uh, to the panelists. Uh, I'm very excited to have been part of this. It's, uh, as I told you before, it's very exciting to see a stage where these uh, very important and critical issues have been, are being discussed in, in, in the World Economic Forum type of events. It's, uh, def it's evident now from the business perspective, the community perspective, government and science that a common framework needs to be developed. But it's my sense that this is just a conversation, a beginning conversation and, and as a starting point. And the conversation has to go on. And we can't, even though it's very frustrating, as you were saying, we keep meeting and talking about the issues, but uh, we, we can't stop. I mean, it's something that we need to come up with a, with a solution. So thank you very much. I just want to end up by reading a very short paragraph that I thought it was um, um, food for thought. If we were to calculate the cost of the services the Amazon provides and consider the permanent destruction of value we are causing for destroying it and compare it with the short-term value its destruction is generating, every reasonable person, politician, economist, businessman, will agree that humanity will be better off if the Amazon is left untouched. Thank you very much. Okay, good.